Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our Parsons Communication Design Lecture Series again. This is April 23rd, uh, 2021, and this is the last uh, one of this semester. And uh, we have our guest, Renda Morton, today. But before we uh, introduce her, we also have uh, Sophia Moon, uh, MPS Communication Design student, uh, class of 21, who will be um, warming us up with her projects. So thank you, Sophia. Take it away. Thank you. It's nice to meet y'all. My name is Sophia. Um, I am a MPS CD student about to graduate. And I would love to kind of share one of my projects that I'm working on right now. Um, let me see if I can. Oh, sorry. Um, I think my file just got misplaced, but. So sorry, uh, one second. Um, so my project is called Cura, and this is a project that I'm doing for one of my classes, um, the studio class, and um, the prompt was basically kind of create uh, any type of like uh, app or uh, ex digital experience for any problem that you want to solve. And I was very interested in the problem of digital health, especially because now in like the post pandemic or like in the pandemic world, everything has become online, even like healthcare. And um, I also come from a background in nutrition. So this was something particularly interesting to me. Um, so what it is, it's a an AI powered telehealth solution that improves patient care through simplified workflows and quality interactions. And so what I did was I created a provider facing desktop app focused on simplifying workflows for the provider's end, um, but also a patient facing mobile app focused on connecting with the provider. And so one of the insights that I was kind of uh, looking into a lot was um, something that I found from my research that by adjusting the provider's workflows and saving them time, that could actually lead to better quality care for the patient because right now a lot of the time um, providers are spending time uh, documenting and doing things that are outside of the actual patient interaction and so I was looking about I, I was looking at like how can I help them save them time and um, tasks that occur outside of the patient interaction and help them spend more time with the patient um, and so one kind of solution idea that I came up with was um, having like a transcription tool during the visit, if this is like the provider's view, um, where the visit would be transcribed. And um, this transcription could then be like visible here um, on, their, on their view. And then um, using this transcription, um, the doctor would be able to kind of create, or the system would be able to kind of create a visit summary. Um, of the of the visit uh, using AI, and then they would be able to kind of revise it and send it to the patient, and um, it would be seen. Sorry, it would be kind of received by the patient like this, where it's kind of a message from the doctor. And um, from my interviews, I found that patients feel like this feels really nice to kind of get a takeaway from the visit, and it also feels like the doctor cares about them. Um, and then, oops. And then um, I was also thinking, since we have the transcription already, why not help doctors uh, complete a task that they already need to do, which is write a note for, so that they can leave it in the patient's medical chart. Um, so by using AI, the note could be kind of auto-filled with certain suggestions that are easy to complete, um, helping kind of quicken the process of writing the note. And those were, that was like, my main, th those were my main solutions for that insight that I was looking into. Um, but these are just some snapshots of other solutions that I won't uh, go into too much, but basically on the patient side, it's focusing mostly on um, connecting with the provider and making sure that the patient feels like all their needs are being uh, expressed. And then on the um, provider's end, it's mostly about being able to complete tasks in, a, in an efficient way um, so that they can kind of get those out of the way and uh, make sure that they're spending time with the patient. 
And so right now I'm, oops, right now I'm not completely done with the project, but I'm still working on some like uh, final iterations and also working on the micro interactions. So I'm excited to kind of complete this project. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. And um, now we're going to go into the main portion of today's lecture, which is Randa Morton. Um, she's a director of product design at uh, Dropbox. And uh, I will let her introduce herself. Thanks, Rand. Share my screen. I'm gonna assume everyone can see this. <laughs> yes, we can yes. see the screen. Great. <laughs> um, so my name is Arenda. Um, As Arenda said, I'm currently a design director at Dropbox. Um, and I'm gonna use the time today to walk you through how I got here. So I'll do a deeper overview of what I've done before Dropbox. Um, and I'm gonna give you a bunch of unsolicited advice about how to negotiate. Because when I was a student, there's a, I wish I had known. <laughs> There's a bunch of things I wish I had known about how to um, do negotiation. I, when Rune asked me about this talk and I asked him what I should talk about, he thought I like sharing my experience of being a designer in different industries. Um, Rune, you said that there are many designers who operate within like specifics, um, but I've had an experience of running my own design studio I'm working in journalism at the New York Times and now working in a tech company, which few people have do. Um, so I'm gonna take you up on that and walk you through that path about um, how I was able to like navigate through those different industries. So starting there, I'll start at the beginning. I'm just personally really envious of people who have career goals. Uh, I graduated from MCAD in Minneapolis, um, and I had a, a career goal then when I graduated, I really wanted to have my own design studio. And I thought that that would just, that would be my entire design career, just be having that studio. Um, here's this image is my senior project that I graduated with. Uh, I left with a degree in interactive media in 2003. I had absolutely no savings for college, so I had to take out about uh, $45,000 in student loans, which took me a long time to pay off. Um, and then this project just pictured, it's a, there's a wall, which I don't have the photo of the other side. So please document your work. <laughs> On the other side, there's a switch um, and it can be pressed by gallery of visitors and it would trigger that computer that you see uh, to dial uh, a payphone at the Minneapolis airport. And then whoever picked up that payphone could speak with the visitors in the gallery. Um, so I was really excited about this when I met it. This is obviously well, well before um, chat roulette or video roulette, um, but it's, I put this in a portfolio with some other graphic design projects and I tried to get a job and it didn't work out very well. <laughs> like this wasn't really uh, work you could get hired on. So it was pretty challenging. So after I graduated and with no concrete plans for figuring out how to get a job, I took out another $3,000 loan to do a three week summer program in the Netherlands uh, called D-Program. It's run through the College of Creative Studies in Detroit. I think they still run it. I don't think they did it um, in 2020 for obvious reasons, but I knew, I knew I needed to get a job, but I didn't know how to do that. So I just did this program instead, <laughs> trying to stall and figure out how to actually get a job. Um, so through this program, um, you the students who do this program do workshops of different design studios in Holland and you visit with designers. And one of the studios I did a workshop with was called Lust. They were a small design studio in The Hague. And like getting to know them through this program, I was able to get an internship with them. It was just a three month internship the day after I graduated. They only paid me 300 euros a month. Um, and then I was able to rent a place for 200 euros. I was living off 100 euros a month. 
and the place I was renting was just um, just a really small one bedroom apartment. I shared it for roommate and we only had one sink. So and it was in the kitchen. So we we're brushing our teeth in the kitchen, instead of the bathroom. It's a very lean situation. I mean, after my internship there, for a couple months, they hired me full time. Um, and at that studio, they did a lot of really interesting work for cultural clients, like artists and museums. A lot of the stuff that I was excited about when I was studying design in school. Um, none of their clients paid them very well. Most of these projects were backed by um, government support and subsidies and grants, but they were all like really interesting opportunities to um, do like visually interesting design work. So like what you see here on the left, this is a digital interface for a museum's permanent collection, the Boyman's Museum at Rotterdam. So it's like a galaxy that you could browse through all the stuff that they can't put on display. Um, top right, this was a website for an art and technology festival that we had in The Hague. And the bottom right, this was um, a self-portrait of myself and um, my boss at the time, Dimi, working at our desk. And it's like a timeline, like image slice self-portrait. <clears throat> working there for two years helped me figure out a lot about what type of design I was interested in. Um, so leaving art school, the type of design that they did was what I thought I was interested in doing, but after practicing it with them for two years, I kind of learned that that just wasn't for me. So here's that same image um, of that art and technology website or the art and technology festival website I worked on. In this image, um, this is an interactive map showing the different venues from the events. Um, and it had some motion and audio, so you have to imagine that. Like this is <laughs> an image of a website from 2004. Um, so visually, this map and this website is really interesting. It's really striking. We've created an interesting form, but functionally, it's it's not very helpful or useful. Like if someone actually wanted to use this to figure out where that venue was or what was at that venue, it's really difficult. Um, and like that, that latter aspect of design was something I realized I was more interested in working on than the former part of making something um, visual, making forms that are more interesting. So when I left, when I ended up leaving the studio, really wanted to focus on um, usability and user experience. So after working in Holland, I moved to New York. I'm not from New York, but I had family living there I could stay with until um, I found a job, which is a privilege and not something that everyone can do. Um, I was free, I started freelancing at a number of small design studios um, who would pay me by the hour, by the day, by the week, um, no benefits. I did get an, I was able to get an offer for a full time job at a studio that I, I truly loved and admired, but I I had to turn it down because the pay was so low and I I wouldn't be able to pay for my rent and my student loans in New York and eat. Um, so I had to, I kind of had to keep freelancing. I didn't really have a lot of choices uh, economically or I didn't think I did. So even though I really wanted to work at a studio and I, I thought that that was the best path than to start my own studio, I couldn't afford to, so I kept freelancing. But because I kept freelancing, I ended up amassing more clients and projects and work that I ended up like growing that studio from. So I ended up starting a studio called Rumors um, with two partners, uh, Holly Grisley and Annie Pressman. We, our first studio space was in this building that we rented on the left um, in Brooklyn. It was in Dumbo. It had fantastic views, but no heat. Uh, it's now a luxury condo if you want to live there. <laughs> um, I think it has heat now. And our design studio, I think we were doing well. We we're doing lots of fun projects. Um, we were able to hire our own interns and an employee. We were able to move to a different <laughs> kind of dumpy building in a different part of Brooklyn. Um, but this one had heat, which was nice. Um, and we were doing lots of fun work that uh, like websites for type foundries, um, doing magazines, book covers, illustrations from the New York Times, um, identities for art galleries, exhibition design. This is just like a whole collage of different things that we worked on. 
Um, it's just exactly what I thought my goal was to have this design studio and do all this fun work. Um, but like what's not included in this collage was all of this other like unglamorous design work that we also were doing in order to make enough money to have our studio. Stuff so like we would do like a website for a lawyer like three or four times a year. Um, like most small businesses, I think we felt like we we're always on the edge financially. Um, but I don't know, it seemed, it seemed worth it. We, we also started, as we got bigger, we started um, hiring an accountant to do our taxes. And this accountant, he was recommended by um, another, other designers in their studios in New York. I'm pretty sure he had worked with all the design studios in New York. Um, and I'd heard that he did Tibor Kalman's taxes. Do y'all know who Tibor Kalman is? Let's see. Your room's nodding. So <laughs> well, if you don't know, he was a very well-known designer in the 80s and 90s. Um, he passed away of cancer in 1999, but he had this iconic design studio, M Co. And he's the editor-in-chief of Colors Magazine. Um, he was interested in social issues and he was known, and this is really cringy reading it now when I looked it up as the bad boy of graphic design. I don't think we would like call someone that in 2021. Um, but the, here's a quote from his obit in the New York Times. He was a stealth styled bad boy of graphic design profession and a harsh critic of formulaic or what he pejoratively termed professional design. He wanted designers to take greater responsibility for how their work influence the surrounding culture. So working with this accountant and like knowing he worked with this design icon, of course we were like, tell us all about it. Like, tell us what it was like to work with Tibor. Watches, he said. <laughs> Tibor only made money from the watches. And he went on to lecture us about how we need to develop some intellectual copyrightable intellectual property so we can actually make money off of our work because our design studio was never was not going to be successful unless we were doing what Tibor was doing which is selling watches so here I don't know if you y'all know but here's um these images show different watch designs that Tibor did with Swatch Watch which is I think you can still buy through Swatch um ah, man so that was tough that was tough to hear it was kind of a downer <laughs> and I have no interest in, in designing watches or selling swatch watches or like hearing like, oh, I gotta, I gotta make copyrightable intellectual property. Like, I don't know. I just, I was like, I don't even know. I don't even know what he's talking about. Um, they seem like really negative on the prospects of us just continuing to do design services for our clients. And he was up in, um, he was up in White Plains. So we had a long train ride back to our office. And on that train ride, I thought about um, an essay I'd read back when I was a student in 2002. And this is an essay by Dimitri Siegel called Fuck Tibor. He wrote this when he was, when Dimitri was an MFA student at Yale. And I mean, he was critiquing this idea of like being a bad boy in graphic design and, the, and that underlying privilege in his work. Tibor was a New York designer. He had great parties, yelled at people, and lived in the loft in downtown New York in the 80s and can be pretty well summed up by a list of his clients. The Ramones, Talking Heads, Larry Anderson, Restaurant Florent. <laughs> Fuck Tibor. My friends are mostly A, uncool, B, broke, but the tenets of Tiborism state that doing work for them is more important than cultivating paying clients or even generating self-initiated projects. Students of design need to develop their own means of producing work. That's interesting and generative. In my experience, good in New York, and trying to meet bands is not a process. So this is a little harsh, and the emphasis here is mine, but um, it's such a, like, it, it's so hard for me now to, like, to think about that and reconcile the watches and selling the watches and selling the watches to subsidize a design, like, practice and an image that would, that, is criticizing other people for being professional designers. Um, like, it, it's like it, it enabled him to do so much and like rail against professional design, but participate it in the same time. So that was, that's a little disillusioning. 
for me. And like after like that experience, I thought about money a lot. Um, here's an image of how we use our studio meeting room to play poker and gamble money. <laughs> Uh, but our studio was financially stable um, and I didn't end up leaving the studio because of money. Um, in fact, my partner, Andy, when I left the studio for four or five years, he kept it going for a much longer time um, and, and he was doing well with that. Um, but I left, I left because the work no longer felt challenging. I, I wasn't learning or growing as I thought it would. It's this dream that I had when I was in college. And it, it, on top of like thinking about the money aspect, it didn't seem worth it either. Um, and then the last year of running the studio, I was just spending so much time like redesigning projects. We weren't uh, involved like after we'd launched them. So I wasn't learning from those design decisions or iterating on that work. Um, so many things to that you have to like focus on to run a business simultaneously, it just, it just was kind of like a struggle to focus and it wasn't it wasn't what I thought I would be when I had that dream of having design studio so so now what so I have to find a new goal <laughs> um I got the opportunity to work in the New York Times and I took it and I didn't really have a goal with that it just I did it sounded like a good idea it's an iconic place I'd been reading the Times for years it felt exciting to be a part of um, something so much bigger, but I was terrified. Um, I'd been working as an independent designer for over 10 years uh, and I worked a lot. I worked nights and weekends. Um, it, it kind of, that like having the studio like took over my life and so it became part of my identity. So leaving that behind was scary because it meant that I was like leaving, changing, who I was or my identity. Like I had no separation between like my work and, and who I was as a person. And this is what it felt like the first year of working at the Times. Um, I've been working in design for 10 years, but I'd never worked at a company that had more than five or six people, um, let alone like a corporation, if you can call the New York Times Corporation. Uh, I had a lot of culture shock there and I felt really feral and I made a lot of mistakes. Um, and then the top of it off, the first project that I had to do there was redesign nytimes.com, which was huge, like major undertaking that took over a year and involved many designers and many, many people, like in 60, 60 plus engineers. And like through that project, I learned what it meant to work as a team rather than like working with clients or running your own business. <laughs> and I thought, I thought that that whole experience that I had working with clients had prepared me for really tough like design conversations and interpersonal relationships and the things you would deal with by having a team, but I was totally wrong. Um, like when we, I, I realized working through this that when at the studio, when we had a client that was really difficult and hard to work with. We would just drop them as a client. Um, and but when you have a team, you can't do that. <laughs> you just have to work through it with people. Um, so I, I went in with like a lot of hubris, thought I, I knew how to work with other people, but I really didn't at all. Um, so like the, when I look at, when I think about this project, like my biggest takeaway was all the things I had to do to like, make it work with such a large group of people and execute design. Um, and that meant like elevating myself out of the pixels of design and focusing more on the outcomes of that design. So when, whenever I got stuck in a conversation about what we see, um, I would fail. And whenever I could get the conversation to talk about what design, the design would help us achieve or help us do, um, we could move forward and progress. Working at the Times also taught me a lot about how to value my work and myself. Um, and financially, it was more transformational than having my design studio. It allowed me to pay off my student loans, which is something I didn't think I would ever be able to do. Um, but that all like came at a cost. 
So I, I got a lot out of it, but I had to give a lot up. Um, early on, as I talked about, like mourning that loss of my identity as an independent designer and, and the loss of having a career goal. And, and there's a big void, um, like not feeling identity lists and, and goal lists. <laughs> uh, like I said, out to have this design studio and now I, I don't know what I do. I guess I just work at this place. So I, I kind of let unintentionally or unintentionally the, the void be filled with the mission of the times and the status of it. And I just let it become just as life consuming as it was to run a studio. Um, and I, I, I let it made me feel whole without examining like the risks associated with that. Um, and it made it so that nothing could feel or seem as important as the New York Times and what it was trying to do, um, especially after the 2016 election. So that was not sustainable <laughs> for me living and working that way. And I worked there for six years. Um, but how can I find something that actually mattered more than that? Um, and, and oh, I, oh, shoot, I still need a goal. Like, why don't I have a goal? I need to like figure out what I'm doing with my life. Um, and I was sh sharing all these anxieties with a, a coworker there um, who is older and had a lot more experience. And she gave me some advice that's really stuck with me, which is that careers are long and she said to me, you've been working for 15 years. Well, guess what? You're going to be working for at least another 30 years. And like, how, like how, how are you going to do the same thing for that long? Um, and that perspective just helped me realize, like, maybe I don't need to have a goal, and that's fine. And I can just do what makes sense for right now. Um, and just know that over like the course of the next 30 years, if I want to continue working and working in design, um, I can't, I can't burn out and uh, burn so hot <laughs> and, all, and all these different experiences. Um, so this is what led me to move to California and work at Dropbox. So I've been living in New York for like 13 years, running my studio, working in the New York Times, but I wanted to continue working in design without it just completely taking over my life. I wanted some distance between my work and myself. Um, and I was drawn to working in tech because um, there was a lot of younger designers um, there that I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of helping um, designers grow um, and sharing my experience with them. And I also wanted to work for a business that made sense <laughs> and how uh, the business makes money. Like so at Dropbox, we offer you a service and you pay for it. We're not selling people's data. There's not advertising involved. Um, and then something that, you know, was important, but not, not as important. <laughs> it's something I didn't, I didn't have to, um, didn't have to lose sleep over. And I also, I wanted to, I wanted to make more money, if only for a short period of time, so that I could give myself more choices um, with what I decide to do next, not knowing what that is, um, and just have the type of choices and privileges that I think Tibor had by selling his watch watches. Um, and I knew. I think through like all those experiences I had, I knew the value that I brought myself and what I could get for it. And that's where I'm gonna segue into the one skill that I developed, <laughs> which you can use no matter what path you choose. If you wanna work at a big company, work for yourself, small studio, um, which is a bunch of unsolicited, very specific advice about negotiation that I wish I knew early on. I think it's helpful for students to know. So my first piece of advice, just to ask for it. And just ask because you just might get what you're asking for. I think a lot of things keep people from asking for things like fear of rejection. 
fear of ruining a relationship or staying friends. Um, I think you just, it won't. <laughs> or even if you do get rejected, like what's the worst thing that could happen? I think more often than not, you just might uh, get more things than worrying that you won't get them. I think women, women ask for what they want less often than men do. Um, and there is a double standard there where you could be perceived as a, um, uh, you could be perceived poorly for doing so, but I would just encourage women to ask even more often than you think you should. And when you ask for it, ask for a lot because it can raise the perceived value of what you're asking for. And it allows you to graciously compromise and come back on something which can make the other person you're negotiating with happy. Everybody wants a discount. Everything is negotiable, almost. <laughs> so don't be afraid to, to ask for something, even if you don't think you could. Negotiate outcomes and not design decisions. So this is one of the biggest lessons I learned um, in working at the Times. When you're seeking approval of your work or buy-in for your work from a client, from a boss, from anyone, um, your teammates, frame it around what the design will do and not what they see. So frame it around the value that you're providing and not the actual thing that you're making. So if you're making a website, don't frame it around, this is a website, but what the website actually intends to do. Um, like Sophia, in your talk, in your warm up, like your your value is saving those providers time, um, not the the apps that you're making to do that. Interests over positions. So a story here. Consider a story of two men quarreling in the library. One wants the window open, and the other wants it closed. They bicker back and forth about how much to leave it open, a crack halfway, three quarters of the way, no solutions are satisfactory to them both. In comes a librarian. She asks why one wants the window open to get some fresh air. And she asks the other man why he wants it closed to avoid the draft. After thinking for a minute, she opens the window in the next room, bringing in fresh air without a draft. So don't get mired in what I call the pixels of design, which is how much the window should be cracked halfway open, so much open, but back out into the actual outcomes or in this case, positions that you want to achieve. And we're all designers, so we're problem solvers. So we're kind of skilled at finding solutions for those as well. Very specific advice about pricing client and freelance work. <laughs> Get information, always ask for a budget. It could always be more than you're thinking and you never wanna leave money at the table. Sometimes people don't wanna share this. So I would just leverage silence as a tool to get people to share that, asking what's your budget and you don't have to say anything um, or justify it and kind of leave it hanging there till people fill, it, fill that in for you. Your time is a very important factor in the costs. Um, so if you think about pricing stuff by how long it will take you, that's, that's one way to do it. But when you do that, you should factor in two things. One, it's the value that your design will provide for that client. So a really famous example, the City Bake logo that Paula Scheer took on um, and she drew in the first meeting with city bank officials when they were came in, coming to the room talking about the logo. Um, so even though she like had sketched it in five minutes, um, it, it's, it's a giant logo for a big corporation. So it didn't matter how long she took to do it. Although she'll say it's because of her experience that took her, um, that she was able to do it so quickly, which isn't untrue, but the value of that logo and word mark to that company was worth whatever the cost was. Um, and it didn't matter how 
much time it would take for someone to create it. So the value it provides and not the time it would take you to make it. But also like what would be, be worth for you to have to do this? Um, if just thinking about doing that project or that design is so painful to you, um, you should ask a lot for it um, just to make it worth it for you to do it. Get a down payment, have a contract, get a kill fee in case the client fires you, which can happen. Negotiating a job offer. They won't revoke the offer if you negotiate. People made you an offer because they want you to work there. So don't, I, it can, you can feel really scared about asking for more, especially when something seems really generous. Um, but you should always ask for a little bit more. Um, and if they do, if they did revoke your job offer, then you probably didn't want to work at a place like that. Ask for what your potential is worth, not just your past experience. So again, um, big bird at the meeting table. <laughs> your compensation is for your skills and experience that you are bringing to the role and also what you have the potential to achieve in that role. Um, so don't lose sight of that. It's not just about um, where you are right now. Um, and what you've been paid before doesn't matter. You don't have to tell uh, potential employers if they ask. In fact, in some states, I know in California, it's illegal for employers to ask job candidates about their salary history. If they do ask, then ask them for their range. If they insist, um, you can say, this job requires X, Y, Z based on my research. This is the range I'm expecting. Is that in line with what you're offering? And then again, just ask for more. I'll, I said this like three times, but you don't even need a reason for it. You can just ask for more. And, and I did this when I got my offer from Dropbox, um, which I, <laughs> when I talked to them on the phone, I said, this, this offer is very generous. I'm very excited about it. I have to ask, can I have more? And they gave me $10,000 more, which is the easiest $10,000 I've ever made by just asking for it without a reason. So always just ask. And if you can't get more money out of your offer, then ask for other things of value, like uh, more paid time off or different flexibilities at work or different things that are valuable to you that might not be monetary. And then always ask when your compensation will be up for review again, um, especially if you weren't able to get everything that you wanted in your initial job offer. That's it, that's all I have, thank you. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. Um, that's a um, great list of, um, advices I feel like and it also resonates really well with me because um, it's very I, I got like similar set of advices from various people but it's great to see that like advices in 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 a single setting like this <laughs> so um, I'd like to open up uh, questions to the floor um, you can I guess, how, how many people in the room? So I guess you can just start speak up if you have any questions, or you can also put your questions in, into the chat. I can relay them, or you can raise hand. I assume students might, oh, here's a question from Joyce. Uh, mm. Have you ever felt discouraged or even unsafe when facing the contradiction between making a living and being able to go for what you really love, your creative freedom as an independent designer and a stable life at a big corporate? What's the force that keeps you going forward and trying to think positive about all that? Yeah, that's a great question. The, the, freedom, the freedom thing was something I was really worried about when I first 
went to work at a company. Um, but then I realized I actually felt like I had more freedoms <laughs> at the company because of the stability. Like I could take more risks because I didn't have to worry about um, I, like running my business into the ground. Like there were other people running the business. <laughs> like I didn't have to worry about like printer breaking or um, I don't know, or there, and like this, like the size of the company, like can absorb like your absences or your mistakes just because there's so many other people there um, to help out with stuff. I don't know. Yeah, but that's just the freedom. So did I ever feel, what's the force that keeps me going? I think for me, it's the impact I have on other people. Um, and so it's less about like the actual design work that we're doing together, but just the growth of the people I'm able to work with um, through like the sponsorship and mentorship and coaching that I can do with the designers on the team. Like that's, um, that's the biggest motivation for me. Cool, thank you. Um, any other questions? I'll jump in, you know, awkward silences. I always say this. Um, hi, Rinda. Um, we have students who are, are seniors who are just on the precipice of graduating and uh, your last few tips and in pieces of advice are um, like super valuable, I believe. And I just was curious from your standpoint, like in getting started, um, like let's say I'm, I'm about to graduate and I wanna begin freelancing. Um, do you have any sort of uh, feedback on like how to begin that process or how to think about your portfolio or your work um, when you're about to go into the world? Yeah, I, um, going into the world, like if you're thinking about what type of work you wanna do, like have like reflect that in your portfolio in some way and like try to make sure your portfolio speaks not just to the what, but like the why of what you're doing and the, the value that your work creates rather than just what the work is, because um, it helps people like see your potential and what you can do for them rather than what you've already done before. I, one other strategy, I think you can, I used to remember, I think when I was freelancing, I would ask around design studios if they would have what I called table scraps, which was like work that they didn't want that they could like throw <laughs> to people. <laughs> to do like when it, even when I had a studio it was always helpful to know like other designers who were freelancing or just looking for like side projects that I could point clients to because um it's still valuable uh for the client to have that recommendation even if I like my studio or I couldn't do that work so trying to form those relationships so you can like get any table scraps from people <laughs> We have another incoming question. Would you ever want to go back to having your own studio? No, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Can I ask you why? <laughs> yeah, I think I don't want to run a small business again. Um, I don't think I would do like a startup <laughs> or something like that again. I don't, I don't know, maybe, I mean, Gosh, I'm going to be working for another 25 years. So who knows? Maybe I would. I think right now, I like right now I don't have a goal. So I don't really, I'm not like working towards like one goal. I'm just kind of doing like what, what's I think makes sense. Like, what do I want to learn next? What's, what do I want to do next? So like right now I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. But maybe, maybe I will later on, especially gosh, after the pandemic. Huh. I'm very much living in the moment. <laughs> um, 
So maybe kind of somewhat related to that, or maybe not. Uh, I actually have a question. Um, your Tibor Kalman story was really powerful. And, uh, and it's a story that I never heard of. And uh, in some ways, I think uh, the question that I have is, is, the, is almost like the question towards the uh, sort of the authenticity of the discipline. Right? Is this, uh, and uh, so in that sense, like, what is it that we're, you know what I mean? Like, if you are, you you believe in, you you are believing on a design that you produce, and you believe in that you're providing value to your clients, but then, by doing that, in return, what you're getting isn't sufficient uh, to 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 sustain yourself then what is the discipline is kind of the question that I'm getting at, like if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, I think like you could be sustainable. It just like Tibor only wanted to do like cool things and then like <laughs> tell other designers to not be professional. Well, okay, like because he sold watches. Like so, yeah. <laughs> so I, th I think it's like, if you wanted to be like picky about, well, I don't want to use the word picky. If you wanted to be particular, if there was only like certain clients or certain things you wanted to do, like he found a way to make it sustainable. He just yeah. wasn't very like, honest about, I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't appreciate the way we like tricked us to like, talk. like it's one thing to be like, Hey, I sell these swatch watches so I can like work for these um, art clients that don't pay me very well. It's like that's fine, but he it's like he got a privilege and just told other people to like have that privilege too, but not the means by which he could one could do it. So, like to me, that says it is sustainable. It's like okay, find your swatch watch and do that, and then you then it like opens up all these choices for you to have. Cool. Um, we have another <laughs> uh, student question. Um, how did you decide to make uh, career jumps from one industry uh, slash design space to another? Yeah, I think the first, when I went to the Times, I just didn't think about it very much. Um, so, I don't know. I just, it just was like, famous place that I loved I was like yeah great I'll, I'll go there <laughs> um, but then leaving the times um, I was more intentional about that because I I kind of felt like I like wasn't just ended up there and didn't really like wasn't intentional about it so I thought about like okay what do I need right now like for my next role and I wanted to take a break from news and media um especially after the 2016 election. Like I used to have to sit in the newsroom and just wanted, I just wanted a break from that. Um, and I wanted to like, I wanted to try out working in tech. Um, so I was interest, interested in uh, working with like younger designers, which were like being like subsumed into tech. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to move to California to just get a break. I, I just had like a set of criteria and then I just went out and like found something that met that criteria. Cool, thank you. And it was um, it was less about the design work and it was more about <laughs> my personal needs. <laughs> so, sorry. Makes sense. Yeah, um, another question from uh, Lynn, our uh, CD faculty. Uh, what have you found to be most transferable skill in terms of skills and process and thinking as you moved across industries? Yeah, the negotiation stuff, because you can, it's not just like negotiating about money, but you can negotiate your ideas and um, just being able to like communicate the value of what you're doing and what you're providing. It's not industry specific, or you could like learn how to like make it seem more industry specific if you learn more about that industry or business. I mean, designers are just great problem solvers and 
you're good at like researching and like knowing your audience. So just treating like your um, team and, and the people you're working with and working for in that same way and like kind of designing designing your self or your process to fit into that. Um, I think like designers are the most adaptable to be able to make, to move across those different things. Great, thank you. Um, if we have one more question, we can take that. Otherwise we'll wrap up. couple more seconds of awkward silence. And um, yeah, I mean, I think we were good to wrap. Um, so thank you so much, Renda, for coming. Thanks for having me. And, yeah, and sharing your very personal stories and then also <laughs> very, very helpful advices uh, to the students. I'm pretty sure this was a really uh, helpful set of things that for the students to hear. and. Um, yeah, thank you again for spending time with our students and us. Thank you. Thank you.